The China and Africa podcast is brought to you in partnership with the Africa China Reporting Project at Witt University in Johannesburg. The ACRP promotes balanced, considered reporting on Africa China relations through innovative training programs held throughout the year. More information at africachinareporting.co.za. Hello and welcome to another edition of the China in Africa podcast. I'm Eric Olander, and as always, I'm joined by Kobus van Staden of the South African Institute of International Affairs in Johannesburg, South Africa. A very good afternoon to you, Kobus. Good afternoon. Kobus, it's been a week since the Forum on China-Africa Cooperation Summit wrapped up in Beijing, and I know you're recovering. How many interviews did you do? 30, 40, 50? <laughs> it felt that many. I think it was a few, a few <laughs> uh, yeah, it was around like 10, 15, I think. But yeah, it's, I'm very tired. <laughs> Just if you guys want to have a little fun here, type in Cobus and FOCAC and you will get a whole <laughs> string of, uh, of search results on it. Um, it was the big event. It was what we all expected in many ways. $60 billion was the headline number that came out of it. Very few surprises, Cobus, in many respects. I mean, we, we talked a little bit going into it that was Africa going to be all looped into the Belt and Road? That didn't come out of it. Uh, big surprise for me that didn't come out of it was the second phase of the Standard Gauge Railway loan for Kenya. Everybody thought that was a done deal, and Uru Kenyatta came home empty-handed on that. So a couple small surprises, but as a whole, it went according to plan. Uh, let's just quickly go over the numbers. We're not going to spend too much time, but I just want to kind of set up our discussion today. Uh, it was $60 billion in financing, and that is, in fact, the same number uh, as back in 2015. However, if you dive into the numbers, there are some substantive differences between the $60 billion that came in 2018 and the package from three years earlier. If you want to see a side-by-side -side comparison, I highly recommend going to check out a little graphic that Wake Forest University professor Lina Abdallah, she put within moments of the package going out, posted it up on Twitter. She's got the 2015 financial pledges and the 2018. Let me quickly kind of review what she wrote. Both, $60 billion. Uh, this year, $15 billion of grants, interest-free loans, and concessional loans. That's compared to $35 billion of preferential and concessional loans three years ago. In 2018, $20 billion of credit lines, $10 billion of special fund for development financing, a $5 billion special fund for financing imports from Africa, and $10 billion of investment in the next three years. Now, that last one, Cobus, is very, very interesting because that's actually not a government commitment. That is going to be private sector investment is one of the things that I was reading. So in many ways, this wasn't a $60 billion package, but this is actually a $50 billion package. So just something that's interesting. We're going to get more breakdown over the next few weeks of what these numbers are. This is, of course, still the very, very high level overview of once you start getting into the nitty gritty, it becomes much more complicated. And Cobus, one other very important point to note is that just because the Chinese pledge this does not always mean that they follow through and actually deliver those funds. So with all that in mind, Cobus, what was your takeaway from this year's FOCAC? It was, uh, I share your, your general kind of view of it. it you know, it, it was a, a significant amount of money being pledged, but obviously it, was, it wasn't it was a jump from the, you know, every, in, through traditionally every FOCAC, we've seen an increase in numbers. This is the first one where we haven't seen an actual increase where the number was the same as before, um, which seemed to me, you know, indicative of that, you know, that, that political times in China are, are quite a bit tougher than they were in 20. 15, um, and that you know that the trade war I think is is having an um, inhibiting effect I think on 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 this relationship, um, but then also it, it's interesting also for me that the debt relief was also worked into the numbers you know so so that seemed uh, you know from the kind of like armchair position it it seemed that maybe China was was reacting to some of the all of this kind of drumbeat of criticism around debt that that we've seen the whole year. Um, all in all, yeah, it, it was it was an interesting an interesting summit. You know, it, it it seemed to it'll be interesting to see kind of where whether it, it indicates a kind of a, a plateauing of the relationship. 
Well, let's talk a little bit about the reaction. And uh, it was very interesting because the media coverage, and we talked about this going into it. We had a whole show on the media coverage that said, it will really depend so much on where you are in the world and how you view this. Uh, in in particular, you talked about the debt issue, and that seemed to polarize people. Uh, Hannah Ryder, who is the an old friend of the program and the CEO of uh, Development Reimagined in Beijing, she wrote in a piece on uh, The Diplomat, uh, her Twitter feed became increasingly polarized, and it remains so. She said, half the people I follow are saying China is guilty of neocolonialism, trapping Africa into a debt crisis with huge loans. The other half say any criticism of the China-Africa relationship is, quote, a Western conspiracy. So that was very interesting. Here in China, it was surprisingly low-key. I mean, of course, on the People's Daily and on CCTV, we had the standard Xi Jinping meets foreign diplomats, but they didn't play it up anywhere near as much as I expected them to. And that might in part be because the economy here is shaky and fragile right now, and the optics of giving away $60 billion, or at least even, you're not giving away $60 billion, but pledging $60 billion in money and capital and loans and all of this for Africa is not necessarily a very popular position to take. Uh, one quote that came out here that really started circulating around social media uh, from an influential Tsinghua University law professor, why is China, with a country of over 100 million people who are still living below the poverty line, playing at being the big flashy spender. And on Weibo, one of the social media networks, someone said, if China has so much money to spare to invest endlessly in Africa, why can't you help your own people at home? That was written by a Chinese netizen. So that is a little sampling of some of the hostility that came uh, on social media here. Uh, the Chinese censors quickly intervened and started cleaning up Weibo and WeChat, making sure that it, that criticism wasn't circulated even wider. But it did show a lot of the disconsent and the resentment. And Kobus, what I think is so interesting is that when I started sharing some of that resentment on Twitter, African followers and users were incredulous. They can't believe this. They they were, well, number one, they, they were surprised to see that there are so many poor people in China. And number two, yes. there was this sense of, wait, this is controversial in China to give out so much money? And it is very controversial. Mm. Mm. It's very interesting, yeah. Uh, yeah, it's, it's it's it's. I think there's also, you know, in in Africa, there is sometimes um, this kind of assumption that everyone wants to help Africa, you know, um, which you know I don't think is necessarily the case. No. Well, let's get some perspective now, and and, and from a different quarter here, and we're really thrilled to have back on the program Luke Patey, who's a senior researcher at the Danish Institute. Uh, for International Studies, for long, long-time listeners of the program. You'll remember him back from a show we did in 2014, right around the time of the release of his book, The New Kings of Crude, China, India, and the Global Struggle for Oil in Sudan and South Sudan. And by the way, for China-Africa students, this is on the list of must-reads that you have to do. On our website, actually, we put on reportingfocac.com, of our top 10 books, that was one. Uh, Luke has been following both China-Africa relations, mostly China-Sudanese relations uh, for a number of years, but also now China and global relations and Chinese foreign policy and Chinese loans around the world. So we thought it would be great to have Luke come back on the program after a few years of a gap and kind of give us and share with his, uh, his views on what happened in FOCAC. Luke, welcome back to the program and thank you for joining us from Denmark. Thanks for having me back. It's wonderful to be here. Well, let's get your take on what happened. $60 billion. We're going to get to a very controversial column that you wrote in the Financial Times a couple days before FOCAC. Uh, we're going to get to that uh, you know, in the second half of our program, but I'd like to get your take right now on what you thought of both the politics of this latest Africa-China summit and also the financial pledges that came out of it. I think it, it's interesting to compare the, the, the financial pledges that came out of uh, this FOCAC round with China's broader economic engagement in Africa. Uh, you, you've already highlighted that they, the numbers did not go up this time. The, the loan uh, pledges um, typically rise every three years. This time they did not. In fact, one could argue that, that there was a downgrade, that the $10 billion dollars uh, pledge or to encourage investors, Chinese investors, to go to Africa means that this was only a $50 billion uh, loan package a pledge from, from Beijing. And I think this is sort of 
acknowledging that there is limited borrowing space on um, for many countries on the African side, and there's uh, limitations for China as a global lender as well. And this reflects, I think, what's going on with trade and investment for China. Trade was 170 billion in 2017. Uh, that was a rise from the year before. But since the commodity price depression uh, began in 2014, we've seen trade levels drop quite significantly. And in the long run, as China's economy shifts away from heavy industry and towards a consumer and, and service driven model, the demand for African oil and minerals, which is still much of the of, of the African exports going to China, is going to, you know, it's going to come down. I think India and Southeast Asia might start to fill the gap, but it's a sign that trade has fallen and, and it will likely stagnate. Um, on investment, if I could say a few words too, what Xi Jinping hopes uh, to encourage is, is around a $3.3 billion per year investment from Chinese companies in Africa. And this is roughly what we should expect from China anyways. In the recent years, there's been around $3 billion in investment from China to the African continent. So this pretty much represents a stagnation of investment, I think. Um, and the, the French scholar Thierry uh, Perrault has, has pointed this out in, in a blog he wrote and has demonstrated actually that Africa is falling in terms of uh, Chinese total global investment, that Africa is falling as a share of that investment. So to round it up, um, I think you know, you're not going to hear it from many Chinese officials. Uh, you're not going to hear it from, from business consultants working in this area. But I think there is a growing conservatism in China towards the, the economic opportunities that Africa offers. And as a result, I think African countries and particularly their leaders and economic managers really need to think about how they can best leverage and utilize China's economic engagement because it's obviously proving to have limitations. Luke, do you get a, a feeling that new cautiousness, is that mostly coming from the Chinese side based on Chinese realities or is it coming from the Chinese experience in Africa? Do, do you get a feeling that, that China is just feeling more conservative generally or that China feels that they've reached the limit of what, they, what uh, collaboration with Africa can offer them? I think it's more the, that China is realizing the limitations in Africa in particular because we're seeing Chinese global investment to other parts of the world rise, uh, uh, usually on average, in the, in the last few years. China's become, just in the last five years, a major global investor. Um, but Africa, as I said, is actually falling as a share of that investment. So there is some hesitation on, on the Chinese side. Another uh, thing that's reflective of that is in, in FOCAC 2015, the last round in Johannesburg, uh, there was a, a China-Africa Industrial Capacity Cooperation Fund of $10 billion, which was put forward by the Chinese side. But since uh, January 2016, when that was uh, officially launched, only $250 million of that has been dispersed. And that's basically funds to try to kickstart uh, you know, domestic African uh, manufacturing and industrial uh, investments. So there, there's sort of a, a tightening of opportunities, I think, that the Chinese see. Yeah, I, I agree with you that Africa is becoming far less important economically to the Chinese, and that's a very sobering message to bring to, to Africans who I don't think really have had that sink in yet. There is still very much is a sense that China needs Africa, and I, I, I don't actually believe that because what I'm seeing is a lot of excitement now in South America, Latin America, in South Asia – particularly ASEAN markets. The Chinese are investing heavily in Vietnam, in Myanmar, in Cambodia. Uh, and not to mention there was a, just a $23 billion fund that was announced for the Middle East and the Arab countries. Uh, so there's a lot of Chinese investment and excitement around the world, but it's not happening in Africa. I will contend, though, that we have long defined the relationship between China and Africa in purely monetary or economic terms. And the, what we're seeing now from my point of view, and I'd like to get your take on this, Luke, is a, a transition that Africa may not be as economically important to China, but it is becoming more politically, diplomatically, and militarily important. 
So the value for China may not rest in African consumers or African commodities, but in its ability to host military bases, to help uh, give it bargaining power at multilateral organizations like the United Nations, World Bank, the World Health Organization. And as China becomes much more of a presence on the world stage, give me your take on that. Yeah, I agree. Um, I think that, you know, we're seeing the economic relationship uh, start to stagnate. It doesn't mean that China's going to, you know, fall out of being Africa's most important economic partner. But um, we're seeing sort of the limitations of it. And, and at the same time, we're seeing the, the geopolitical rhetoric and the ideological rhetoric ramping up. Um, we're seeing sort of, just as you pointed out, Hannah Ryder uh, alluded to, that there's this sort of any sort of criticism uh, of, of, you know, China's model and, and China's approach in Africa is really pushed aside. Um, and I think that China views Africa and its 54 countries as a, as a key um, uh, as key political partners in pushing ahead, I think, some of its broader foreign policies, like the Belt and Road. It wants to get African countries signed up to demonstrate to the rest of the world that uh, this is uh, a key policy for for the developing world. Um, it wants it's already achieved. I mean, getting uh, almost all of that all of Africa's countries except one um, from from uh, stepping away from relations with Taipei. Uh, it also, I think, looking towards UN reform, that could be reform and peacekeeping in particular. Uh, China's looking to sort of roll back some of the human rights and some of the more interventionalist uh, um, norms that have come into peacekeeping. And it can get those, those policies rolled back by getting African partners on its side. Luke, what was your impression of the, the the status of the Belt and Road during FOCAC? Like, you know, how how did it come up? All of all of this talk about the Belt and Road being enlarged to include African countries. There were Belt and Road deals signed with Namibia, for example, shortly before FOCAC. Um, how, where are we standing Belt and Road wise now post FOCAC? Well, I think Africa has been a, a key venue for Chinese construction companies to, to cut their international teeth early on before the Belt and Road. So I think there was, there was less space for, for new, big new projects to come, uh, um, to come on stream and to be highlighted in, in FOCAC. Um, but I think, you know, the Belt and Road is sort of reaching in the future. Uh, very much here in the present, but it's also reaching in the past. Uh, basically, anything that China has done, it, particularly in terms of infrastructure, railways, um, and, and, and other projects, is now sort of stamped with the Belt and Road mark. Uh, even in Argentina, one railway, uh, Chinese-built railway that I follow there, it was first uh, started um, to be constructed in 2004, had a long delay, you know, went through a lot of issues, but it's, it has also been sort of marked as a Belt and Road project. So I think, you know, China's going to um, try to get as many African countries to sign on, but there's going to be limited space um, because African countries have you know, a strong debt burden on them, um, not just from China, but from Western lenders. So I think there's, there's limited borrowing space for African countries to really take on too many large scale infrastructure projects. So um, it's more about, I think, for China trying to demonstrate uh, the benefits that have come to Africa through those already existing infrastructure projects and ones that are being built now. Support for this podcast comes from the Africa China Reporting Project at Wits University School of Journalism in Johannesburg. The ACRP provides reporting grants, workshops, and other professional development opportunities for both African and Chinese journalists. Follow the ACRP on Twitter at Vits China Africa or visit africachinareporting.co.za for information about grants and upcoming seminars. Okay, well, let's get to the most sensitive part of this. And this is the so-called debt trap diplomacy debate that really roiled the coverage, uh, particularly in the West. In the United States and Europe, if you looked at the New York Times, the Wall Street Journal, the Washington Post, uh, most of the coverage of FOCAC somewhere either in the lead sentence or in the headline 
had the words concerns about debt somewhere in there. I mean, and it was just a filter that it all went through. Don't get me started on Voice of America. Basically, VOA was only about debt. That's all they talked about. Uh, and then internationally, I think BBC and Al Jazeera did a little bit of they a little bit more mixed, but there was a lot of their coverage was about debt. Here in China, the coverage, of course, was win-win. Everything's great. <laughs> no mention of the debt. And when they did mention the debt, it was always this very strong pushback from the Chinese government and Chinese leaders saying that they are not the ones adding to the debt. So, so that was kind of a breakdown. But in the run-up to it, as I mentioned at the beginning of the show, Luke, you were a part of this voice. In fact, you had a column in the Financial Times that got a lot of attention for the few days that it was uh, circulating on Twitter and the rest of the internet. The Chinese model is failing Africa. I mean, boy, that is a headline that sticks out at you. And, uh, and really the essence, let me just read a quote, and I'd like you to kind of make your case on this. Uh, After more than a decade of vaulting, growth, of vaulting growth in trade, finance, and investment, you write, China's weighty engagement is jeopardizing future development prospects in Africa. You did not mince words. You said basically this is a bad deal for Africa. Tell us why. Sure. Well, I think first and foremost, often, you know, headlines are, are, are put up there to attract, but they often also distract from the content of the article. And um, what I was trying to push forward in this article was that we need to start looking at the developmental impact of China's economic engagement in Africa. And um, I I really don't agree with the debt trap diplomacy stuff that the U.S. media has has been all over in in the last two weeks. There are few uh, African countries that even have high levels of debt to China. And I really don't agree with the win-win rhetoric that comes out of Beijing. So I wanted to push a little bit of back from that rhetoric. Um, and, and my thinking, if, if I can sort of have a – just give you a little bit about the background of, of this article. My thinking started um, when I was asked to give a presentation in Norway on how the Norwegians could learn from China in Africa. So how they could learn uh, in terms of – uh, development assistance, but also how they can learn from ch- how China's traded and invested in Africa. And leaving uh, the event, um, I, I, I started to read more into the literature, and I realized that I could have, I could easily sort of demonstrate how Norwegian businesses can learn from Chinese companies engage in Africa. But it was harder for me to explain how the Norwegians could learn from China in terms of development. Um, and I started to dig around in, in some of the literature in this area, and I, and I was sort of struck by two trends on infrastructure and manufacturing. So the Chinese model and proponents of it argue that Africa can borrow debt from, can take on debt from China to build heavy infrastructure, railways, roads, uh, hydropower dams, etc., and that they can also get a lot of manufacturing investment from China that will produce jobs because wage levels are rising in China. Africa has lower wage levels, so they can really spur on uh, industrialization and widespread development. And this we saw you know, in the rhetoric in FOCAC 2018, just, just last week, um, but also in editorials and even research, um, arguing that there's going to be sort of uh, uh, Africa will become the, the new factory of the world. Uh, the title that China once held and still holds today. So I wanted to sort of unpack, uh, you know, what that means in terms of infrastructure and manufacturing. So on infrastructure, what struck me was that when I read uh, the research that had been done on China's own infrastructure, I found that it actually had quite a bad track record. Um, Over half of the infrastructure projects that China made produced a burden on the economy. They didn't help the Chinese economy, they produced a burden on it. So by this, I I really thought, you know, Africans, of course, need infrastructure. Uh, The African continent has a huge, gaping $100 billion annual debt of infrastructure. But it's important to unpack what infrastructure is. We shouldn't just build infrastructure for the sake of it. Roads need cars and trucks to move on, on them. Railways need cargo to move on them. Office buildings need to have offices that are busy uh, with activities. And many of China's infrastructure uh, are, are either over-congested roads or underused roads. Um, and I thought that this is not necessarily uh, a good model for Africa um, to, to take on because 
Africa can't borrow at the same levels that China did. I mean, China was developing throughout the 1980s with really bad infrastructure, but accumulating wealth, building its manufacturing industry. And it wasn't until even you could say the last decade or last 15 years where that infrastructure boom really happened. So I found research that pointed to the fact that infrastructure doesn't create economic growth necessarily. It's actually a product of economic growth. And, and so what's key is not just to look at infrastructure and debt, but to look at what economic activity infrastructure is producing. And so that's my, sort of un, Africa needs to unpack and African leaders, I'm sure, are looking at these issues. But I think they need to look more closely at what infrastructure will bring in terms of economic activity. So just I'm trying to get my head around around um, this, you know, this status of infrastructure in relation to, econo to economic development. So uh, how, you know, one of the one of the big arguments that, that is always made about African development is it's so difficult to develop because because, you know, it's, you know, all of the development is happening, but then, you, you know, you build a factory, for example, but there's no way to get the, the goods you produce to a harbor or, you know, this it's very difficult to it's very difficult to, to create economic linkages because because the physical linkages are, have not been set up. Um, and then obviously, you know, kind of from the from the Chinese side, there is this idea that you build all this infrastructure and then the economic development will happen around that infrastructure. So how, you know, in, in, in the opposite case, if, if one looks at infrastructure as the product of of of, of economic development, um, how does the economic development happen then? Well, it happens by by economic activity coming, be, I think, before the infrastructure. You need some, I mean, I agree, Africa, particularly Africa, among all regions in the world, heavily needs infrastructure. Um, but it can't overdo it. So unless, and therefore, there comes the debt that will end up hurting the economy if the infrastructure is overdone. So the, the second thing I looked at then was that is Africa producing the economic activity to pay for all the new infrastructure. And, and I looked at the potential that manufacturing investment will come from around the world, but particularly from China, to, to help sort of exploit the infrastructure positively, right? And what I discovered was that when I read research uh, done by Peking University, was that most Chinese manufacturers even though there were rising wage levels, were in fact staying at home. They were countering these rising wage levels by investing more in machinery, taking advantage of cost effectiveness, in particular, uh, you know, automation and robotics. And those companies that are going abroad, uh, the vast majority of them do not choose Africa. They chose uh, South and Southeast Asia, uh, you know, Vietnam, Indonesia, Bangladesh, and other countries that had comparable wage levels to many African countries, skilled labor, and also were proximity closer to China. So I came to, to the conclusion that looking forward, we're not going to see the tremendous growth in manufacturing across the African continent as the proponents of this model claim, but rather we may see pockets of growth in some African countries. And that many African countries, if they continue down the road of borrowing debt, because on average debt levels have risen quite sharply on the continent, uh, that debt coming from mostly Western lenders, of course, but they're going to have a crisis if the debt continues to pile up without the economic activity. And that's especially concerning right now if we look at the trends of emerging markets really suffering capital outflows right now. Uh, as investors, particularly in Turkey and Argentina now, are fleeing for safe for harbors in the United States and Europe. And, and Africa is particularly vulnerable to this. So, so there's a lot of, of, of risk entailed with all this debt. I, I will definitely agree with you 100%. And, and I've said this for a number of years on the program that I don't think Africa is going to become a next industrial power, the next made in, uh, made in China is going to become made in Africa. Uh, because labor is only one very small part of the manufacturing process that that everybody seems to focus on, but they don't talk about road to rail. They don't talk about supply chain logistics, that to build a shoe, you need leather, you need string, you need cloth, you need all of those different supplies, the chemicals that go into it, the boxes, and all of those suppliers have to be in within a, a proximity. And there's networks of this. This is why when you go to Chinese cities here, 
There's entire shoe cities, there are entire computer cities, there are entire software cities. I mean, it's just every industry has their own city here with rings of suppliers that are around them. And all of that network together is what makes a manufacturing powerhouse, not just low cost labor. And to your point, uh, Southeast Asia, particularly Vietnam, is very well positioned to kind of benefit from the interplay between China and Vietnam. So on that point, I definitely agree with you. I want to kind of talk about the the standard gauge railway. And you brought this up in your column. And, and, and you wrote that uh, instead of refurbishing the existing line, which would have been a far cheaper option, Kenya paid three times more than the industry standard. This has been a very common critique. And I guess the question that I have is the fact that, sure, that may be the case. You can go to President Kenyatta and you can say, for only $1 billion or however much it was, you can refurbish it. And Kenyatta may turn around, I don't know this, so this may be completely wrong. Sure, a billion bucks. Where am I going to get a billion bucks? And capital markets aren't going to loan it to me. Western banks aren't going to loan it to me. The World Bank won't give me a billion dollars. But the Chinese are going to give me three billion at low interest loans that I can pay back over 50 years. And I can get it done. If I, if I have to go the other route, I won't get it done. And I think that's been the, the big issue in Africa when we talk about infrastructure development with the West. Sure, the United States talks a great game. You know, don't work with the Chinese, don't take on this debt, but they're not willing to, to roll out the, the money for Kenyatta to, pr to produce these rail lines. So kind of, you know, where would he have gotten the money to do this if it hadn't been for the Chinese? I mean, where would a third of the price, he still has to raise that capital. Where does that come from? I agree that China offers Africa more opportunities than existed before it, it, it sort of arrived uh, and re returned to the continent uh, at the turn of the century and that Africans should take advantage of, of, of those financial offers and investment and trade. Um, but, I, you know, I, I've seen uh, countries in different parts of the world push back a little, even when China was the only one coming to their door. And let me tell you the example of Cristina Krishner in Argentina. So very quickly, Argentina was uh, uh, had really sort of frayed relations with the West and the U.S. in particular. And Christina Krishner turned to China um, for trade and for finance, much like uh, many African countries only really have China as, as their main um, partner in terms of finance because of the, the other uh, other le other lenders are much more cost costly and, and slower. And Krishner, because she had sort of labor unions and civil society pushing for her to, to make sure that the agreement would include uh, large portions uh, that would go towards hiring Argentinian labor and particularly hiring Argentine companies to engage in these projects, was able to get sometimes half, if not more, of those loans to actually stay in the country and to not be tied uh, entirely to Chinese companies. So my point here is I think even though China is the only one coming to many African countries' doors um, in terms of building this infrastructure, there's much more negotiation space for African countries, particularly Kenya, Ethiopia, Nigeria, the, the bigger markets, to push back and to capture more of, of those loans so that the money all doesn't go to Chinese contractors. Um, so I think to answer your question, I think even though uh, we sh even though you know China is you know one of the only options for African countries, we shouldn't just stop there uh, okay, and that, accept but, it. But yeah. but in fairness, and Kobus, I'd like to get your take on this as well. But let me first, in fair and, and again, I'm I'm playing devil's advocate here just to kind of to get a discussion going. You may say that, but the Chinese know how to ne negotiate as well, and we saw it in FOCAC. again. One of the big surprises for me was the fact that Kenyatta went to Beijing with a contract in his pocket to sign the second stage of the standard gauge railway. And he had a lot of pressure this time to improve environmental conditions, improve labor conditions. It was a better deal for Kenya. There's no doubt. It was cheaper. It was, it was exactly what you said. What did the Chinese do? Nope, not going to sign that deal. And, you know, I mean, the Chinese are getting smarter about this in terms of dealing with Africa and Africans. And I'm not necessarily sure that you can drive a harder bargain. We have a big experiment going underway right now with in Malaysia with Mohamed Mahathir, the 93-year-old president who is doing something as you're talking about. He's pushing back. 
And right now it looks like those deals are going to fall apart. So if you're Kenyatta and you've got to build a railway or get this industrialization going, and now we have proof that the Chinese are willing to back away and just say, you know what, you're on your own, find someone else to finance it. I think it's easy to write, you know, they should do something else. But the reality of when you're in the negotiating room, you have to to do something. You've got people depending on you. And so, again, I just think it's a cheap criticism that a lot of people throw against Africans for taking on this debt without actually going to the second part of that equation, which is that the Chinese have a voice in this as well. What's your take on that? Yeah, I, I think it's a good point. And, and, I, and I think that uh, African countries are most African countries, uh, are, well, all of them are really, you know, in the power relationship with China, not the ones on top. Um, and this is why I suggest that, you know, there is more regional blocks negotiating with China, um, that that countries get together and 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 sort of have standards of terms that come with the loans and, and allow access into their markets. For instance, the East African community uh, together is a much better uh, negotiating, has a much more negotiating power with China when it works, when it works together. And I think that, um, I mean, the Malaysian example is an ex- another example of a country saying no to China. Uh, it's not, Mahathir is not interested in these projects because he had, um, uh, his predecessor was connected to a lot of corrupt dealings around those projects. So we also have to recognize that for some African leaders, and I don't know specifics um, uh, to the Kenyan deals, but official, Kenyan officials have already been arrested on corruption charges connected to the Standard Gauge Railway. I know that large oil pipeline projects that Western investors have looked in, looked at in Kenya have been delayed by fears of corruption and land speculation. So sometimes leaders in all different countries are not looking towards industrialization as their number one goal to get loans from China or other lenders. They have political goals, they have uh, goals of personal enrichment to themselves personally, or to expand their political party's reach in the country. So it might not be that Kenyatta uh, saw this simply as an industrialization project. It might have also been because the election was coming up in Kenya. He wanted this to be done to demonstrate to his political constituencies that he was getting that he was getting this infrastructure projects in. Let me just get Kobus's take on this very quickly, because I think it's very interesting. There's two contracting points of view here. Uh, the Chinese side, which I was articulating, but also now what uh, what Luke is saying. Kobus, give us your perspective on this. Um, you, yeah, it's, it's, it's very interesting for me to, to, to watch this kind of playing out because there's so much riding on it narratively, you know, the, the, both in Africa, there's, there's so much pressure at the moment for, for transcontinental uh, or or trans frontier integration, especially, uh, infrastructure integration. And the Standard Gauge Railway was going to be the jewel in the crowd of that, of that particular project. Um, and with it, the, you know, as we've seen in Ethiopia, um, we've seen Chinese investment, you know, taking, taking, um, advantage of this kind of cross frontier infrastructure by also setting up special economic zones and populating them with a certain number of Chinese companies. It was all it all worked together as a, as a model, or then anyway, it was narrated as a kind of model. Um, so what was what's very interesting for me is now the question of whether this model is starting to fall apart. Um, you know, with with these these uh, financing deals starting to hit kind of rocky uh, rocky shores um, and. Luca, I actually wanted to ask you about that as well. Um, you, you mentioned in you know that that so much of this Chinese infrastructure in the Chinese case was was actually a weight on the economy rather than growing the economy. In what way was it a weight on the economy? Was it simply that it was too expensive, or was it a, diff- a wrong kind of infrastructure or, or badly run infrastructure? And and connected to that. Are there lessons that Africa can take to, you know, in, in, in looking at this model, or is the model itself fundamentally corrupt? The problem with a lot of Chinese infrastructure is simply that it's underutilized. So, um, uh, the bro- you know, cars and trucks are not using roads. They're just sitting empty most of the time. And when roads are being used in Beijing or Shanghai, they're completely congested and there's traffic, and that's also underperforming. So I think it, it's more that there was an underutilization of a lot of this infrastructure and that the infrastructure was built for the sake of building the infrastructure. 
And I'm afraid that sometimes that's what's happening in some of these larger uh, African projects, particularly the standard gauge railway. Uh, so the, the most important thing, I think, with the railway for Kenya was building it and, and, and the, maybe the political benefits that came out of, of building it for Kenyatta and his party. Because when I look at its performance to date, and I admit it's very early in its, in its lifespan, it's only been a year since it was finished, and it's a celebrated passenger line, and we should you know, congratulate uh, the Kenyans and the Chinese on, on developing that as, as, a, as a passenger line. But it wasn't supposed to be a train that would primarily uh, transport people. It was supposed to transport goods. And, you know, the Chinese ambassador to Kenya came out uh, a few weeks ago and said that one million tons of goods have, uh, trans have been transported on, on the scan standard gauge railway from Mombasa to Nairobi since it was built. But even Mombasa port is is pushing 30 million uh, uh, goods, tons of goods every year. So it's really a low percentage, around 3 uh, percent with these rough numbers um, that that is moving on the railway, and that's mostly Chinese imports coming in because we know that Kenya has a steep deficit to, to China. So in order for this to work, in order for this railway to start to, um, to pay off dividends for the Kenyan economy, something needs to go out of the country too. And, and the Kenyans, you know, their biggest imports are tea and coffee, uh, so they're going to need to really get these industrial zones going. Um, but they need to start their own industrial zones. I mean, they need to really build their own domestic firms and, and try to get as much um, support from, from, from donors and from China and, and anyone else to, to build the competitiveness of their domestic firms. Because I think there's also a, a great sort of myth about special economic zones. You know, we constantly hear about the Hawassa industrial zone in, in, in Ethiopia and that it's, it, it has – you know, 10,000 people working there and it's going to be expanded. But the, the numbers from the Ministry of Commerce in China um, show that out of 99 industrial parks that they have, that China has created in 44 different countries, the average job creation has been 59, 59 local jobs come out of these industrial parks. So I think, you know, we often hear about Hawassa Industrial Park because it's the only one that is really producing large amounts. Um, and, and if I can just talk about this as a sign of the deeper trend of China's economic engagement with Africa. Trade is really concentrated on exports, African exports of oil and minerals. 64% uh, of exports are oil and minerals. Chinese imports, 45% of them go to three countries, Egypt, South Africa, Nigeria. This is pocketed trade with the continent. The same goes for foreign direct investment. 44% goes to five countries. And now debt, 56% goes to five countries. So I think the development prospects are going to be similar. We're going to see, uh, you know, Ethiopia in particular uh, take a lot of, of the, I think, the, the, they'll be able to get the Chinese model working to a certain extent, because they do have a, a consumer market. You know, they have 100 million people and a future consumer market that's attractive to investors. But most other African countries don't. So I think we're really, China's sort of developmental impact is, is similar to its economic relations. It's going to be pocketed. I think this is a sobering wake-up call, particularly for Africans, to better understand the relationship, because it is not an equitable relationship across the continent, as Lucas pointed out. Uh, the Chinese model is failing Africa is the column in the Financial Times. The Financial Times is a paid service, but I think it does have a leaky firewall for one or two articles a month that you can go and see it. I highly recommend it. It is um, – it's not as fleshed out as you've made it on the – you know, I'm – I would have liked more detail in this article than than as you gave on the show, because uh, I was a little bit kind of miffed when I read the article. But now hearing you, it, it all makes a lot more sense. But that is the limitations of space that you get to work with in a place like the Financial Times. Uh, Luke Patey is also the author of The New Kings of Crude, which is an excellent book on China, South Sudan, China, Sudan relations back in 2014. It's still very much relevant today. Uh, and so uh, I highly recommend you go and pick that up. Hey, Luke, you are on uh, Twitter these days. I see you uh, there. What's the best way for people to follow you? What's your Twitter handle? It's uh, simply my name, Luke Patey. 
That's P-A-T-E-Y. And you're while you started in China, Africa, and did a lot of research there and wrote a book on it, now today you're looking at China and debt, China and the world. What's your what's your specialty these days at the Danish Institute of International Affairs? I'm starting to look at uh, China's um, infrastructure, finance, and investment and trade with other parts of the world, um, South America, uh, also here in Europe, and seeing how China is responding to a lot of sort of the risks it encounters, uh, and a lot of sort of the pushback it's feeling, um, particularly here in, in Europe, um, but also from I think you know labor groups and civil civil society groups. In Latin America as well, which I think are, are a key component of the, the story and relations with Africa too, um, that there is an, an active civil society in, in many African countries that can help to manage the relationship more positively for developmental outcomes. Awesome. Well, listen, everybody, I encourage you to follow Luke and engage him on Twitter and to see what he's reading and writing these days, because he's one of the more interesting guys out there talking about China, as you hear, in a very sometimes contrarian way, contrary to what the Chinese will certainly put out, but also looking at the details of the money. Luke, thank you so much for taking the time to come back on the show, and hopefully it won't be another three or four years before you're back again. Yeah, thanks for having me again. So I was a little surprised, Gobis, listening to Luke here, because when he was saying the Chinese model is failing Africa, I thought he was talking about the debt financed infrastructure model in Africa and where the idea is you build infrastructure, take on some debt today, and then in the future with industrialization, you'll pay it off. It turns out that his argument is a little bit more nuanced about this because he was talking about China's own development model and the way that they build infrastructure here, which, as he rightly pointed out, is not always done for the, you know, out of market reasons or economic reasons. They will build these ghost cities. They will build freeways in the middle of nowhere, subways that are not necessarily running full of people. But that's a different story in a country of 1.4 billion people. I used to go into Shenzhen back in 2003, 2004 which is the city right across from the border from Hong Kong. I was a grad student and friends and I, we'd go over the border, we'd buy fake DVDs, and then we'd play this game where we would go into a building and we press any floor on the elevator just on the whim that someone would be there. And sure enough, nine out of 10 floors were completely vacant because they, they built all of these towers without any sense of whether or not you know people were gonna come into them. And at, back in the day, people said, God, these Chinese are so stupid. Look at they're building these towers and nobody's renting them out because supply side and demand side are not always aligned here in China. But the mindset is, and I see this here in Shanghai in some of these new neighborhoods, they build these towers and you know what? Somebody's gonna come at some point. And sure enough, again, in a country this big, it happens. Today, Shenzhen is a city of 10 million people it's one of the most innovative cities in the world. And the people who built those towers 10, 15, 20 years ago are millionaires. And so that's one part of it. The other part of it is that they're building infrastructure as a way to juice the economy. So it's not being built for the infrastructure. And on that point, I think he's absolutely right. They're building infrastructure as a jobs program, very much the same way that the United States in the Depression built infrastructure as a way to employ people to get them out of the Depression. So this is a way, and you're already starting to hear now, if the trade war goes on and the economy starts to slow, they're going to ramp up and rev up that infrastructure machine to start building bridges. You should know this very well from your time in Japan, because there was the famous, you know, we're going to pave the bottom of rivers in Japan <laughs> just to keep people employed, just to pay off the corrupt contractors. So this is a common Asian technique. And I don't know if I fully agree with him in terms of whether or not it's a good use of it, because as somebody who's been in China for a very long time, who remembers the days when they had no infrastructure, and now zipping around Shanghai in bullet trains and modern subways and freeways, yes, they're congested, it's a very hard argument to make that this model doesn't work, because now China is the second largest economy in the world. And in many ways, it has worked. And as you talked about on our last show, Building infrastructure is a messy, messy game. And I think if you look at the micro, you can find all sorts of different problems, but you step back and it, start, it starts to make a little bit more sense. And I, so I don't know if I fully agree with his criticism there. 
Yeah, you know, I think I think we we're talking on two different time scales. Like he he looks, it sounds to me, and you know, again, I might be misrepresenting his work, but it sounds to me that he's that he's looking a lot at at existing need, you know, existing demand, um, and and ways to to meet that demand, which is a very legit way of looking at infrastructure. Um, but as you say, you know, the 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 model of infrastructure provision that that China's taken up was, I think, to a certain extent. Um, started by Japan, and Japan tended to do this thing, especially if you, if you look at post-war, um, a place like Nagoya, for example, where I used to live. Um, uh, you know, Nagoya was essentially bombed to dust, you know, during during the Second World War, so it was almost completely rebuilt. Um, and they tended to put in train lines first, before they had neighborhoods, you know, before the, the, the train lines were necessarily connecting to anything or any places where there were lots of people. They tended to put in the train lines immediately and then the development started around them um which you know which which probably looked like craziness at that stage but it turned out to to then grow a city that was very well serviced and, and quite orderly and efficient um and doesn't have you know nagoya has as a quite a large city it's japan's largest city but it has not a lot of traffic problems for example because every single neighborhood that exists now has a train line or had a train line before it existed um and, you know, obviously, I don't think that Africa is necessarily following that model, you know, completely. But it, it was interesting in the way that, that Luke laid it out, where on the one hand, the, you know, so, so one, one can criticize the standard gauge railway for not, not carrying as much freight as, as it should. And I think that's a very legitimate criticism. Um, but one of the big reasons why it's not carrying that much freight is because of trucking cartels, um, you know, kind of you, who, who run the kind of, have a kind of a, a local local political slash economic kind of stranglehold on on the freight industry there. So it's a government and politics problem, not necessarily an infrastructure problem in the Kenyan case particularly. Um, and you know, so so if if one jumps five years into the future and you're like, okay, so they, they sorted out the, the cartel problem, and now now you know the the train is carrying three times more freight, then suddenly the the investment starts looking a little bit different. You know, so so it it, it well. One of the challenges isn't, isn't necessarily the, the infrastructure alone, but how to get the entire country to to cooperate on that on that kind of new system. Yeah, that's so fascinating. Okay, our show has gone on way longer than normal, but we thought after FOCAC and the events that happened last week, it's worth kind of diving into it a little bit deeper and to get that perspective on the debt issue, on the fact that this year's FOCAC pledge uh, was significantly less than what it was in 2015. It's subject to interpretation as to why and what that means. Of course, people will be analyzing this in the weeks ahead a month. We're going to try and do some more FOCAC shows in the weeks ahead from some different perspectives. We're going to have a Chinese perspective in our next program, and then we're going to try and get a Kenyan perspective in the program after that so that we can look at this from all different sides. So we'll hope that you'll join us for those programs. In the meantime, please do join our discussions online. We have great discussions going on over on LinkedIn. Cobus is now also starting to post on LinkedIn as well. So look for either one of us there. And every Monday, we have a newsletter that goes out and you can sign up for it. Just look in the show notes of this podcast on your phone and you can find the link to sign up for the newsletter where we put a really greatly curated a selection of China Africa news from sources in Africa, in Asia, and around the world. So we hope that you'll sign up for that as well. So that'll do it for this edition of the China in Africa podcast. Kobus and I will be back again next week with another show. Thank you so much for listening. The discussion continues online. Head over to facebook.com slash China Africa project to share your thoughts on today's show. The guys are also on Twitter, where you can find Kobus at Stadinsky or Eric at E. Olander. And be sure to sign up for the weekly China and Africa email newsletter by going to www.chinaafricaproject.com.